Hello, everybody. We're back again with Stacy from The Advisor. And today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. We have Karen Hall today, and she is an international bestseller. She is a writer for the Los Angeles Tribune Women's Journal. She is a speaker. She does it all. She's just amazing. And she's here today to tell a little about herself, what she does. She has an amazing podcast, very similar to The Advisor. She really, it's about all self-improvement, empathy, love speaking from the heart so she has she's going to tell us a little about her podcast and how she got all into this because one thing led to another and she has just an amazing story to tell so Karen tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do well thank you Stacy thank you so much for having me as a guest on the advisor I am so happy to meet you and and it is fun how our podcasts are very similar and we both like you know having inspiring guests that share their stories. And so that's really fun that we have that in common. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, what I started my, my life started in, where I was born two and a half months premature and I weighed one pound, 13 ounces shortly wow. after birth. So I could have had epilepsy, <laughs> you know, that was one of the risks that I could have had or cerebral palsy or any number of things. In fact, they told my parents I wouldn't survive. And if I did, that I would be a vegetable, but I'm not. Thank heavens. Miraculously, I defied the odds of death and I was a tiny, but mighty fighter. And, but I spending those two and a half months all alone in the incubator, my mom, in those days, she wasn't allowed to touch me or feed me or anything. And so I, I was all alone and I, you know, I've, I've often thought about that. And, and one, one day I was thinking, and I thought, but was I really alone? Because mm. I believe that God held me in his arms while I was in that incubator. I believe there were probably angels all around me to, mm. to, to comfort me and, and to help me to stay alive. And, and so I have always had a deep spirituality, even though my father was an atheist, my mother was an agnostic. I wasn't raised with religion and mm. we didn't go to church or anything like that, but I've always turned to God. I was always just intrigued if anybody talked about God I wanted to know more yeah <laughs> and, mm -hmm. well I so I really related you know when you were talking about your spirituality and I feel like it's a, such an important thing that even if we're not raised with it I think that we all gravitate toward the divine and some people call it source or they might call it universe or or love or light or or whatever but but we're really all speaking the same language and so that has governed my life and striving to be connected, to be aligned. And the other thing that I've, I've struggled with is anxiety and, and dealing with fears. I had a lot of fears as a little girl. And so my mom, in trying to help me to overcome my fears and my dad, um, they would give me pep talks and tell me about their stories of overcoming, which is probably why I am so drawn <laughs> to hearing stories of people that overcome. But my mom used to read to me the story of the little engine that could. Did you know that story? Yes. Mm -hmm. and so the little blue engine okay. that you know was was um, came along and and the train had broken down and all the other trains wouldn't help, but the little blue engine said, "Well, I think I could help." <laughs> and so mm -hmm. she helped bring the do dolls and toys and good things to the other side of the mountain and all the way up the hill. She's saying, "I think I can. I think I can. I think I can." And that was my first lesson in mindset work. And that was my first mantra. And so I would do anything scary, you know, ride my bike to school by myself or do anything. I would say, my mom said, as you pedal, say, I think I can, I think I can. <laughs> and I did. And, and that was how I found my voice to get on stages, to, to take a public speaking class, to write my first article, to do all those things that I was scared to do. And in fact, Public speaking was so terrifying for me that I there was no way that I wanted to have anything to do with it. And when I was in college, my mom said, you need to take a public speaking class. And, and when I was in high school, she said, you need to take a drama class. And I'm like, no way. And she said, yes. And she, she was always encouraging me to get outside my comfort zone. And so I did. I took the drama class and then I took the public speaking class. And I, I even, my husband even gave me singing lessons because I was so scared to sing by myself in a, in a choir, no problem. Even a quartet, fine. As long as you're singing the same notes, I am. But <laughs> really scared me. And so I had to do a lot of things to face those fears 
but I always thought, I think I can. I think I can. And I say that when I get on stage to this day, I think I can. <laughs> and so <laughs> the little engine that could was really influential in my life to carry me through and to help me to overcome my obstacles and to help me to face my fears. And, and then as I did that, I realized that I was increasing my emotional intelligence by becoming more self-aware and I was, I was always very aware of other people's feelings. I'm, I'm an empath and I'm a highly sensitive person. And so then recognizing that these, you know, moments of adversity and sometimes years of adversity that I had gone through were actually blessings in my life because they helped me to develop even greater empathy and the ability to be more effective in, in my connections with other people because connection drives me probably because I didn't have it for, you know, for those beginning years, it's like air for me. And, and so I always wanted to be more effective in my relationships and in my communications and in my um, connections with people. And so I realized that that was, that was a key and that, that, that those obstacles and those adversities were actually a blessing in my life. I feel the same way you do. Did you feel like every time you went through something in life, it made you stronger? It brought the resilience for out of you. I think I think each time we go through things, I feel like sometimes it makes us a better person. It, it really, it helped, you know, we look at obstacles as a bad thing, or we look at things that happen to us in a negative way. But in in a, in, in, in another sense, it, it molds us to be better and it molds us to be stronger. What do you think? Absolutely, a hundred percent. And and yet, every time I go through obstacles, not quite as much now that I'm a grandma, but but in my <laughs> younger, <laughs> every time I would I would get hit with something and you know bad news or some difficulty or whatever, I would be like, I can't believe that happened, <laughs> which is this thing that I would say all the time, because it did. Oftentimes, it did come out of the blue, and it would be such a surprise to me, and. Yeah. Um, and I didn't like it. I, I didn't like feeling emotionally dysregulated. And that was something that I really had to work on was how yeah. to calm my nervous system. And I didn't know how to do it for many years. I, I would, my favorite thing to do is to talk about it yeah. <laughs> and to connect with somebody that helps me tremendously to be able to regulate my nervous system. But sometimes at three in the morning, there's no one to talk to. And so <laughs> I had I had to learn these skills to self-regulate and, um, and prayer was a big one, but I needed to learn even more than that. And so as I, as I shifted my perspective and I would, I remember when I was going through a particularly difficult time and I was thinking, I, I used, as a girl, I would always write postcards and whenever we would go on a trip, I would send people postcards. And of course on a postcard, you only have so much room and nobody probably knows what a postcard even is now. <laughs> A, it was just this very small card, you know, about yeah. five by seven or something. And you only had half the side where you could write the note and the other half was the address. And so yeah. it would be very concise in what I would write. And I would write the highlights of, of whatever the event was. And I remember thinking, what if I look back on this difficult thing that I'm going through? What would the postcard say? And yeah. that, that really helped me to kind of think about my future self looking back on what I was going through and to reframe it. And that helped me to say, what would be the good thing that I would, that I would say was coming out of this. And sometimes I would imagine and I would say, what could possibly be the good thing that could come out of this right now? You know, what, what could I possibly gain? And, and I, I use my imagination a lot. <laughs> One of the tools that I found that was very helpful for me was to use my imagination and to imagine what would I say later was the good thing that I got out of this obstacle. I think, I think my imagination also helped me a lot. Also, I think um, I would take myself sometimes out of the situation and I would put myself in a different situation and for, you know, and sometimes I would put music on and I would get myself into a, just a, a little state of, of, of woo woo and then just put myself into a, into a, a different state, a different place, a different, you know, and I would just imagine myself there and it would calm me and it would be to the point where I would create scenarios in my head that I knew that would bring people peace and serenity into my life. And it did, it calmed me down, it relaxed me. And I also found too, I don't know if you also found this, I found journaling to be very constructive therapy. 
I, I also found that meditation and yoga helped me out a lot. It really, it taught me a lot. The meditation taught me different breathing techniques, different ways to relax myself and bring myself to a level of calmness. Yoga just, it, it did lots of different things. It could bring you to that state of calmness, but yet it can make you, you know, it can make you uh, like have a vitality and, and give you strength and I can do it, you know, and, you know, and you're in the toughest times, you, you think yoga might not be, it might be easy, but it could be very tough in those, some of those poses, but if you're determined, you could get through the exercise and that strengthens you and gives you qualities too, that you didn't maybe have, you know, think you had, but you actually did. Right. Yes. I, I found journaling. I, I, I've been writing in a journal ever since I was very young. I think my yeah. first journal was when I was like eight or nine and and I and I was made when I went back and and read that journal and the things I was already working on some of these mindset tools and trying to figure things out and trying to <laughs> look at things differently and yeah. and I remember you know how powerful journaling was for me it was it was cathartic it was the other thing that I noticed about journaling even as a girl was yeah. that when I got it on paper, it was like a different part. I was using a different part of my brain. And so I became the observer and I would read that back and say, is that really true? I didn't really, I don't remember asking that specific question because that's one that came later, but, but I remember thinking that and, and looking at it differently. And, and I think that helped me to become the observer of my thoughts and to also become curious about what I was thinking. And so journaling has been extremely powerful for me. And I think that is probably where I developed some of my love for writing, because I, I remember reading about Laura Ingalls Wilder, you know, and how, and how she kept her journal and, and then she became a writer. And so I wanted to become a writer. And, and when John Boy on the Waltons, you know, he, he had a journal and then he became a writer and, yeah. and you know, Anne of Green Gables. I loved Anne of Green Gables. And so it was interesting how those, those were some of the key influences for me that motivated me to write in a journal and to aspire to be a writer. And I feel like that was divine. I feel like I came with that at a very young age. And I feel like that was a seed that came, you know, from heaven that helped me to guide me in, in my, not only to help me personally, but then to be able to share that, you know, with other people. And so I, now I want to be like you, <laughs> and I, <laughs> you know, I want to have 20 bestsellers someday like you. <laughs> I, I feel like, I, you know, I used to do what journal is. I used to write and then I would look back on it once I, once I completed the journal and the part, the part areas of, of my life that I overcame and I would rip those part of the journal out because I, I, I got through it and I've accomplished it. I learned how to cope with it and I moved on. So to me, that was the past. And I always thought about the past is a past. We can't change the past, but we focus on the present and we work on our, our, our we work in the now to make a, a more, you know, healthy and happy, productive future for ourselves. So I would take everything from the past that I overcame and I would just throw it away. And then I would just like, you know, and work my way into the point where there was no more pages in the journal. And I would start a fresh journal and then I would just, you know, and, and work it through there. But like you, I found it very inspiring. I think maybe that's where my love for writing maybe had begun just like you. Yes, I bet it, I bet it did. And, and I found that it was so healing for me to write in my journal. And, and now when I go back and, and read those things, you know, I've, I've heard of people that their families read their journals and they were so grateful to have their journals. And, and I hoped that at some point, you know, somebody would read something that I had written and it would be helpful. I don't know if anybody's ever going to make it through all my journals. <laughs> <laughs> when I write the book, you know, I can hopefully encapsulate the, the main points, but I did want people to know, especially my own children, I wanted them to know those hard moments, you know, when I had postpartum depression, when I was a new mom and, and I wanted them to know that, that it, you know, I got through it, that, that it, it was okay. And that there was help available and, and that it gave me greater empathy, you know, for other new mothers, boy, I, I wanted to make sure that I took dinner over and that I supported new mothers. And when my, my daughters have children now, and, and I want to support them as much as I possibly can, because I know how much 
I, I needed that in my own life. And so I want to give that to other people as well. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I have three children and my middle child, my daughter, when I had her, I had postpartum depression and, you know, I couldn't understand it at first. I, I gave birth to this beautiful little girl and every day I would be in tears. I would be unhappy crying and I didn't understand why. And I saw my doctor and, you know, my mother had suffered from depression in her life. And I was like, so afraid that I was like, oh my God, am I turned into my mother? I said, what's happening? I'm like, and he laughed at me. He's like, Stacy, you have postpartum depression. And he worked with me to overcome it. And, you know, so I, I know how it feels. It could be, you know, it, it's, a, it's a terrible feeling because, because you're, you're in the, such a joyous state, but you're, you're not feeling the joy. You feel empty inside. And it's because everything is off, but it's, it's, and for people who may not understand what's going on or they don't know how to deal with it, it's important to have that support and to have people understand and, and reinforce them that it's going to be okay. And, and they, we didn't used to talk about it as much, but, but now wow. we're so grateful, like, like you have said before that, you know, breaking that stigma of, of mental illness and, and, and regardless of whether it's something that you're born with or if it's situational or, or however it is that, that you are dealing with it, that there is help available and, and we, we can receive that help so that we can feel happier. And I, I think that that is such a miracle that we do have the ability to connect with other people and to learn. You know, I, if, if I were going through that and you were going through that and you shared, I would be so grateful to know, yeah. oh, Stacey, how, how are you getting through it? You know, and just yeah. like, just like with your, your, you know, your articles in epilepsy, I would be reaching out and saying, Stacey, how are you doing it? And I would be so thankful to hear from you and to connect with you and to gain that support, to, to know tools and tips and strategies, and even just knowing that I wasn't alone and that, that you cared. Just knowing that someone cares makes yeah. all the difference in my life. It's, it's, it's so important. You know, I, I think people don't realize how important it is to show care, love and empathy. And we talked about this um, earlier on your show. And, it, and, you know, when you have you show kindness, gratitude, love and empathy, those four things go so far in life. And, you know, you need to you need to apply it to your own life, but yet you need to apply it and, and, sh and be like that with others. And, you know, using the, those those characteristics and sharing love and kindness and, and and showing your gratitude just to, you know, all these things, you know, go a long way and people appreciate it and people feel special and people feel that trust and then they can open up to you. And, you know, you might be able to help somebody or you might just be able to bring a smile to somebody that has had a, a very hard day, you know, but, you know, if, if people could just take the time to, you know, really think about what they they say and how they say it and to just do you know maybe do one kind thing a day you know anything you know one kind thing you know the world could be such a better place and you know just even texting somebody and saying something nice to them you know can make a world a difference absolutely and you know you touched on something that I was so powerful for me was as an empath it was so easy for me to to connect with other people. I felt their energies and I would, I wanted to reach out. And, and as a caregiver, as a dietitian, I loved helping my, my patients and, and as a coach with my clients, but I forgot to give empathy to myself. And so yeah. when I was emotionally dysregulated and I was trying to learn how to calm my own nervous system, the key for me was to have that same compassion for myself that I had for other people, because yeah. I felt judgment about myself. I felt like I should be over it. You know, I shouldn't have my feelings hurt. I should, I had heard all these messages in my mind that other yeah. people had said to me, you know, aren't you, aren't you done yet? <laughs> are you I still, do. you know, are you feeling still hurt, you know, and oh, you're yeah. so sensitive. And I'd heard these things all my life growing up. And so I felt shame about how I felt things so deeply and, yeah. and it took me a while to, to recover and to get grounded, you know, and to, to feel better and pro and took time to process those emotions because I, they were so intense for me. And yeah. so when I learned that, that, that I had to have compassion for myself, the way that I had compassion for other people, it changed everything for me. And, and I still forget, I still, I still default to the, to the shoulds sometimes. And I have yeah. to, when I, when I start to 
you know, remember, and I, I come back to my clear thinking and I'm like, oh yeah, I can be, I can be nice to myself too. And I can show that love to myself. And I think self-love is something that a lot of people misinterpret. They think it's selfish, but yes. self act for me actually helps me to heal to where I can come back to clearer thinking. And then I have, I have the ability to love others in a greater way. My focus right. is on myself. It's I'm able to, to look outward then. And so I, I think that self-love is very powerful because it enables us to love other people more. Oh, a hundred percent. And that's, you tapped on some great points because one, you know, so many people forget to love themselves and, you know, one is the guilt, you know, they feel shameful if they, if they, if they take care of themselves before they take care of others, you know, especially moms, you know, they, they feel like, you know, their family comes first, the kids come first, you know, the husband or, you know, or their partner comes first and they, they, they focus on everybody, but then you, you can see they're getting worn down. You can see that they're getting drained. And how can you care for others? I always say, if you can't care for yourself, you know, you always have, you know, it's okay to put yourself first. You know, everybody needs a little me time. Everybody needs self-love. And that's such an important, you know, topic because, you know, so many people, you know, just, they just feel uh, that, that they shouldn't love themselves first, that everything else comes before them. But then, you know, mentally it could be draining for people, you know, and then physically too, you know, people go for food for comfort because they have, they're just drained and, and, you know, or their mentality changes and they, they get so, so overstressed that, you know, they, they start to get, you know, depressed or they start to get anxiety or, you know, they start to, you know, different things happen, but just a little me time, like maybe even taking a, a bath with some Epsom salts and some scents and you just, you know, or taking a walk and, 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 you know, maybe going outside and just, you know, taking a breath of fresh air, just something that you enjoy or putting on your favorite song and maybe dancing when no one's around, you know, just something that you enjoy, you know? Absolutely. Or listening to your favorite podcast and an inspiring yes. story. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And I think that's such, such a great thing because I, you know, over 50%, 7% globally listen to podcasts, you know, and radio is not as popular anymore because so many people are turning to podcasts because, you know, they're getting so much out of it and there's so many different podcast to choose from and you can listen to so many different hosts and, and so many different people come on and they you know you could just scroll through and just look at something that relates to you and get such great advice and get such great inspiration and and you know hope and, and motivation you know because you you know if you can just feel motivated by one podcast or even get find the solution to an answer you've been looking for it could be a game changer in your life Absolutely. Absolutely. So many times when I listen to a story on a podcast, there's a nugget in there and I just hold on to that nugget. And then many times I write it down and I have a list on my phone of affirmations and I, and I add it and it's, yeah. I, I was just listening to somebody talking on a podcast today about their epic journey and they were quoting somebody. And I was like, that's my life. It's an epic journey. I'm going to remember that to remind myself of that, you know, that when, when, when those obstacles come, this is part of the epic journey, you know, just yeah. living, living the dream. <laughs> exactly. I like that. I like that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, it, that's how we have to look at life as a journey, you know, and it, it's a, it's a never ending journey until, until the day comes, you know, and I say, appreciate the time you have on earth. You know, so many people take for granted, you know, the time we have, we always think, oh, we're going to be here a long time, but you never know what the next day may bring. So really the moment you have now, you should make the most of it. You know, the day you have today, the moment you're breathing the air around you, take that day to make the best day you possibly can because you never know what the next day may bring and, you know and some people you know you see people too they hold you know re resentment towards people or they they get angry towards people and people don't talk for so long we'll never get that time back you know forgiveness is a big thing too I don't know how you feel about that but you know it, it has to be a point where you just you know you forgive and you forget and that could be very it's easier said than done but you know do you live life with a brick on your shoulders and do you live life with hurt inside your heart or do you learn how to forgive? Because you don't have to listen. You don't have to hear the person say, I'm sorry. 
You just have to understand the situation and forgive that person for their actions. And what a wow, it, it enlightens you. It could just make, it could be a game changer in your own life. And I, I feel that's so important. You know, with you, you know, in your podcast, you talk about empathy, you talk about the heart, you talk about all these type of things. What's your intake on forgiveness? Oh my goodness. So I have had to really work on forgiveness because I feel things so deeply and I didn't yeah. understand, you know, I, I think a lot before I speak. And so I didn't understand why people would say hurtful things and then say, oh, it's just joking. And I'm like, well, that wasn't very funny, you know? And, yeah. and so, and, and most highly sensitive people do think a lot before they, um, before they say things and they're, they're very conscientious because they feel things so deeply and they remember yeah. things so much. And yeah. so that was that was confusing for me and i remember and uh, you know my mom had to work with me on that too and she would say just be like a duck and let it just roll off your back <laughs> <laughs> i would just laugh and i would say well i feel like i have velcro on my back you know and <laughs> well, um, she she just let things roll off her back and i i didn't really understand how to do that and i i remember thinking it was like twitching my ear or something i mean it just felt like foreign and yeah. so, so I had to really work a lot on changing my, my thoughts about things and giving people the benefit of the doubt and really trying to understand where they were coming from. And that's why compassion was so important for me to learn because when I had compassion for them and I really believed that they were doing the best they could, I saw them differently. And I, I trained with Marianne Williamson and I became a spiritual life coach under her. And I remember reading her book back in the nineties and she wrote the book return to love. And I was having a hard time feeling love towards people that had hurt my feelings. Some of these people yeah. kept, kept hurting my feelings. Some of them yeah. were family members and, yeah. and it was very challenging for me. And so it yeah. wasn't like I just say, well, I'm just not going to talk to them anymore, you know, because they were family members. And so right. that's one of the things that um, she talked about was recognizing that they were a being of love. And that I was a being of love and that if, if they were being unkind or unloving, they just forgot who they were and they forgot who I was. And the same with me when I was acting in an unloving way, I forgot who I really was and I forgot who you were and right. was so powerful for me. And that was one of my very powerful mantras. It's still a very powerful mantra in my life that I repeat every day. I, I, Re, you know, work on that. And I, because when I, emotions are escalated, if I've repeated that and I've strengthened that neural pathway so that I can access that information, it yeah. comes to me and I, I return back to remembering that truth. And when I can remember that truth, it shifts how I see the whole situation. And another yeah. thing that, that Marianne Williamson says is um, she'll ask, are you willing to see things differently? Well, if I think I'm right and you're wrong and I'm not willing to see things differently, that can make it very challenging to forgive. But if yeah. I can see things differently, if I can use that imagination that we both talked about, if I can mm -hmm. use my imagination and then think, what, why possibly could that person have done that or said that thing? Or how could, if I was watching a movie of this situation, how would I look at these characters differently? How would I, what would I think about this differently? Yeah. Uh, and there's always a different way to look at it. Then, yeah. then that shifted my my whole perspective. And and I I like the thought about the astronauts when when we saw them, you know, what they thought the Earth looked like from far yeah. away. I always loved um, pictures of clouds and 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 I and like the postcard. You know, I would try <laughs> and gain perspective on things, and I would try and think of things. How would I look at this differently? And yeah. and I. The, to this very day, I love being in the clouds. I loved, I love thinking that, wow, down there, it, you know, it's raining and it's cloudy and it's, you know, stormy, but up here above the clouds, the sun's still shining. And it yeah. just amazes me how, how that is the case. And so forgiveness for me was so powerful because it was a gift I gave myself. It wasn't about the other person. It was about myself. And and the, you know, like the rattlesnake bite, we talk about, you know, do we chase after the rattlesnake and try and get revenge? Well, if we do, the poison just goes into our bloodstream and, and can kill us. But if we work to get that, that poison out, then, 
then we can be we can be whole we can be healthy again and so for me it was about removing that poison from myself and and allowing myself to return to love so that I could feel loving feelings toward that person now that doesn't happen overnight in most cases Mm -hmm. Uh, it's definitely a process I've worked with a lot of people that have been through some severe traumas I've been through trauma and I it's been a process for me and sometimes I just say I'm willing to be willing (laughs) to forgive I'm not (laughs) there yet and I still haven't processed these things and I still feel angry or I still feel hurt or whatever it is but I want to feel better and I and I'm willing to to be willing to look at it differently. And then I would be willing to look at it differently. And then, you know, I would take those steps and I would move through it. And and just just being willing was huge yeah. for me because I would recognize within my body, within my mind, I didn't like the way that it felt. And that was what motivated me to to want to overcome that that hurt or anger or whatever that thing was that I needed to forgive. And then the interesting thing is that even if I didn't talk to that person and I forgave them, our relationship changed. It was like the energy waves just went through the universe somehow and touched them and came back to me. It was like a boomerang. And it really was a gift that I gave myself. And so I have had to work my whole life on forgiving. And and now I I, I help other people to learn to do that from I want them to learn it quicker. I, I teach all my children. And, and as they were little, I, I talked to them a lot about forgiving because I didn't want them to suffer like I yeah. had. I wanted them to be able to, to, to learn how to forgive and to learn those keys of compassion and, and trying to understand, you know, where the other person possibly might be coming from and, and to, to recognize that they, in 99% of cases, people are doing the best they can with what they know at the time. And most of the time, if they do know better, they're in an escalated state where they can't remember it. (laughs) And so, you know, sometimes you think, well, gosh, I know that person knows better because they act better other times. But in that moment, they might, they might not know better because they may have forgotten. Yeah. Oh, that's a wonderful analogy of it. You know, it's, it's so important, you know, I'm an empath myself. So it's like, I am very sensitive. I always think before I speak. And so when people do say things that could be hurtful to me, I take it to heart. And sometimes it's very hard to get out of my head because I I overanalyze it and I try not to overanalyze anything, but it's like, I don't understand why they would say that, you know, that's so hurtful. You know, they're close to me. They were close to me, you know, like, why would they do that? You know? And it, and it's hard sometimes to let go. And it's like, and you just want to get it out of your head. You just want to move on. And it's like those, those emotions keep pulling you back, you know, into it. And then you have to work your way out of it. But I like how you just, you know, you thought about it. You, you know, you, you learned something from the book, you applied it. And you kept saying that, that phrase over and over again until the point where it became whole part of you. And, and then it, it started to relieve you from, from a lot of the, you know, the frustration or anger that you were feeling of why, why did they do this? Why did they say this? Yes, absolutely. And, and when you talked about the bricks, you know, it, it really is like carrying around a weight. And when I went, when I've gone through the forgiveness process, each layer of forgiveness lifted weights off my shoulder and, yeah. and I was able to feel happier and I was able to feel more connected with people. I was able to feel more connected with my spirituality. I felt that I was more connected with divine messages. And so yeah. it is such a powerful tool. And I, and I think that it is, it, most people don't understand that it's for our benefit. It, it's yeah. not for the other person's benefit. It's for our benefit to forgive. Right. I mean, um, they benefit too. I think we both benefit, but that's not, <laughs> if you, if, <laughs> even if you never talk to that person, um, it, it, it can be a blessing for you but just to help you move forward. So. Oh yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. No, truly, truly. And I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's so important in life to, to be able to move forward because so many people get stuck in life 
And, you know, and, 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 you know, that's a, that's a big topic, you know, a lot of people deal with is just getting stuck, not being able to know how to move forward. And, you know, it's so important to have a healthy, happy and productive life and moving forward is part of it. You know, what's your intake and advice for people who kind of get stuck? They, they just, you get into a situation in life. They just don't know how to move on, how to get, just to get from point A to point B. They're just like, they're, they're, they're stuck in whatever situation, you know, and they just don't know how to get out of it. Right. So that, that's a, a really good point because I get stuck, you know? And so one of the things that I, I have learned to do is to think about it, as I mentioned, like a movie and to think, okay, you know, what would I, what would I say to me as the star of the movie? And, and as an audience member, I would probably say, I would have compassion for her. And I would say, oh, that's so hard. I, I don't know how you're doing it. Oh my goodness. I'm so proud of you for the ways that you were trying. And, and I would also say to myself, it's okay if you're stuck. It's okay if you feel that way. And offering that compassion to myself because I felt so much pressure to get over it quicker. That was yeah. one of the things that was a divine message for me that it's okay. I, I can take all the time that I need to. And when I give myself permission, mm -hmm. I process quicker because I yeah. feel loved. I feel safe. I feel supported even by myself. I feel, I feel all of that from myself, which is so ironic that doing, saying that to myself, it kind of sounds odd to say that to myself and to realize that I could feel supported by saying it to myself, but I do. I feel like I have a friend that cares and, and, and I feel like, okay, it just takes this this pressure off and and the other thing that it does is it allows me to feel the feeling that it's okay however I feel and and when I practice self-love and then I am curious what is this emotion trying to tell me it always tells me that there is a wound there that there yeah. is something else that needs addressed something else that needs love something yeah. else that needs to be cared for and supported and nurtured and, and bandaged, you know, and, and helped to heal. And so that again, gives me more compassion for myself and it allows me to look a little deeper. And, and when those emotions come and I try to welcome those emotions in, instead of pushing them away or, you know, rejecting them or judging them when I, yeah. when I have compassion, even for the feelings, that compassion is, is so powerful for me. And it, it dissipates those yeah. emotions. And I am, um, I move through my emotions start to deescalate to where, because for me, that's when I get the most stuck is when my emotions are escalated. My nervous system is totally dysregulated. I am so stuck. And so I have to go through those tools step by step, you know, deescalate bit by bit. And then I come to more clear thinking. I remember more tools. I remember to go read my mantras on my phone, <laughs> you know, and I, and I remember to do those steps and then I, and then I start to see things differently and I start to feel love for myself and, and then I, I become unstuck. And so, but it, but until I begin to dysregulate, I am stuck for quite some time. <laughs> and so I, I have to do several things. My, my go-to, as I mentioned, is I want to talk to somebody because many times the person that I talk to is one of my kids or my husband or, you know, a, a really close friend. And they remind me of the things. Now, remember when you said this, remember how you, how you need to do this. And they remind me of my own tools that I have totally forgotten. They've all flown out the window when I'm, you know, <laughs> it is so funny for me. And in fact, many times my, you know, my, my loved ones, quote things back to me that I have taught them. And I'm so grateful that they do because, or, or if there's nobody to talk to, as I mentioned, three in the morning, um, yeah. sometimes, I, sometimes I go read my journal and I, and I read my own messages <laughs> to myself and, yeah. and, and I, and I, I like to think about, um, that really I am my own best friend and, yeah. you know, I can turn to God I can turn to, you know, angels, I can turn to uh, my journal and um, prayer and, and music, like you mentioned, music is, is very powerful for me. And, um, and then the other thing that I do is with regard to the movie, 
is I become the the director and the screenwriter. What would I want? Because you know, I talk about heroes. So if if I was the heroine, what would the heroine do right now? And I and I ask myself that question. Now I can't ask myself that question until I become a little more dysregulated. But when I do ask myself that question, that's a powerful thought because yeah. I think, oh, I want to be my best version of myself. And yeah. I want to be loving. I want to have as much love as I possibly can. And what would I do? And and another one of my mantras is that question, what would love do? What would love do in this situation? And it does different things at different times. Even in the same situation, it does different things um, based on what we're capable of. I might ha- I might need to set a boundary. I might need to recognize that I'm people pleasing. Or I might need to think of how I could serve this person. And so it's it's different what love would do because a lot of times people think that that means one thing, but it doesn't mean one thing. It, it means different things. And listening to my heart and listening to my intuition and to my divine messages helps me to know what, what love would do in those situations. And so I, I try to get still after I'm, you know, a little more dysregulated and, and I can actually listen <laughs> and do those things. And then that helps me to come, become more regulated in my nervous system so that I can feel that love. Cause sometimes it's first in the head and I, yeah, think, yeah I, I, I want to do this. I'm thinking of the mantra, but I'm not quite to my heart yet where I believe it and feel it. And so it takes yeah. a process for me to move from my head to my heart. Right. Yes. Yes. That's a beautiful analogy. It's so true though. You know, it's, it's a process and you kind of, you know, you, you go from your head and then you, you know, you go, I, I think, you know, the communication and being able to communicate with your heart and then to really start to really absorb everything, you know, and then you get to that level of calmness and you think into the whole situation and then, then you ask yourself, okay, what would I do? And my husband always tells me, read your book read the book you wrote. <laughs> <laughs> That's why my family quotes back to me how I coach because they're like, this is what you taught us. <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> it's, it's so true. I, I just think, yeah, I, I could, I, I could, I could listen to my, to my self coaching. <laughs> and you know, what's, so, what's so interesting about that is that I have used that as a weapon against myself at times. I have said to myself, well, you're a coach. You sh- you teach people how to do this all the time. You should know what to do. You should be right. able to get your head to your heart. And I even judge myself to hold myself to a higher standard sometimes where I, I'm like, I have to remember I'm human. I have those human moments. I forget everything that I teach people right. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and to have that compassion for myself as well. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Yeah, and, and it's true. And everybody needs a coach. Everybody needs somebody, you know, and even the best of best coaches need a coach. You know, they need somebody to talk to. And it's great to get somebody with unbiased opinion. You know, that that that's what I think is really good is when someone can talk to you and just give you that unbiased opinion that doesn't know you as well, you know, like your family members and can look at from the outside and be able to, you know, tell you what they think from the situation that you know you provided to them you know so I I always think it's really important you know to to really take in you know advice from other people and to be open and to share and 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 all those things are really important factors I think in in the healing process yes oh I totally agree I was I was talking to a new coach and she'd gone through a lot of trauma in her life and I was dealing with some trauma I could not see the situation differently I could not see it differently it was just this was what I I had concluded and I and it felt like 100% true and um and she just gave me a new thought and she said what I see in this situation is this and when she said that I was like how could you possibly see that and then she started telling me all the reasons why and it it was so incredibly foreign to me she had to repeat it several times and Mm -hmm. I sunk in and I real I just started laughing I was like you are absolutely right. It was like, <laughs> so all of a sudden it was so clear. And I thought, how could I have believed the other thing before? And I was so thankful to her because her wisdom was really profound. 
Yeah. I, I, it was outside of my consciousness. I absolutely could not, even when it became into consciousness, I couldn't even yeah. accept it because it was so foreign to my, to my conclusion. And, and yeah. yet it was such a powerful moment. It created a huge paradigm shift for me. And it was so healing for me and it released incredible trauma that I had held. And mm -hmm. so I, I think the power of a coach, whether they know us or they don't know us, I think is, is, um, often underestimated and I appreciate you bringing that up because I've had that in my own life and and now when I'm able to do that for someone else oh, it's so rewarding it just it is, it it is makes, so makes uh, sense. tell me some of the, the um the services that you provide so you do coaching yeah so I I coach um I coach on relationships and so I often end up coaching people that are up leveling that are entrepreneurs they're dealing with fears or people that have dealt with trauma or in their you know relationship with their partner or with their children and um and people that are dealing with fears and so people kind of gravitate to me that are, are dealing with trauma because of that and oftentimes they are very tender-hearted sensitive people and they feel things deeply but some of them aren't i have i have some um people that would not describe themselves the way I still think they do, but they would not describe themselves that way. But uh, so I do that. And then I also, you know, as we mentioned, I have the podcast here within, I um, am writing and I am um, with the Los Angeles Tribune, I'm helping to give a voice to the voiceless. And one of the things that is so interesting, if I could just share this a little bit about the Tribune is this is what attracted me to to joining with the Tribune is the uh, CEO is named Mo Rock. And he wanted to give more women platforms where they could speak. And he noticed that in the personal development world, there was Tony Robbins, Gary Vee, you know, all of these men, you know, Bob Proctor, Jim Rohn, and all, all of these men were dominating in the, the personal development space. And he said, we need to get more women on those stages. We need to, to elevate women. And, and then the podcast network was started. Um, Michael Silvers started that. And um, Mo said, I want to have more women in podcasters. I think it's like 80% are men. And so, um, and then he said to, to me, I, I want to have a women's journal where women can have a place where they can share their story and have an article and they can speak at our global events so that what, people all over the world can hear their messages. And I was like, wow. When, and the other thing was he wanted to flip the narrative from 17 negative news pieces to one positive um, news. He wanted to flip that to 17 positive to one negative. And I was like, what news agency is doing that? <laughs> you know, as being, you know, in that, in that um, world, I know, you know that. And so I was amazed and I, because I love positivity, I was like, wow, for me to be able to help women to be, and men, I, I also am with the Spanish journal. We have several different journals now with the, the Tribune and with speaking events. I can help people share their messages, not just on the podcast, not just in my book, but but they could share it globally and, and have millions of views that yeah. that they might not be able to reach otherwise. And so so now I'm a part of that. And, and I just feel so grateful. Mary Glorfield was an executive vice president with Tony Robbins and She's our mentor and she, with Michael Silvers and, uh, and Mo and Sandy Scarlata and others, they train us and, and help us to where others can speak and share their messages. And so I just feel so grateful to be among such superstars that are yeah. now, their legacy is to help others to be able to have their voice. And I feel like you're doing the same thing. I feel like that's, that's also your mission. Oh, thank you. You're amazing. Now, where can people get a hold of you? So they can find me, you know, on LinkedIn. Um, my podcast is The Hero Within with Karen Hall, and I'm on YouTube or any uh, any platform where you listen to your podcast. They could also email me at karenhallcoaching <clears throat> at gmail.com. And, uh, and they could, you know, you could put my contact information in the show notes. So and before we go, if you had to emphasize on, on our whole conversation and you wanted to really focus on some important points, what are the things you'd like to emphasize to the listeners about what we discussed today? Well, I think when we, you know, surveys are done, I, I love neuroscience. And so I love learning about how the brain works. And I, I love research. I, I, 
you know, with nutrition, I was always doing research and learning about the studies. And so I, I transferred that into neuroscience and in relationships. And, and the thing that we find is that everyone wants to be happier. And how yeah. can we be happier? We can be happier by learning about ourselves, becoming more self-aware to be, be able to understand the emotions of others and, and increasing our emotional intelligence really helps us to be happier. It also helps us to be more successful. I, I found the studies to be fascinating about how teaching people emotional intelligence skills help their productivity, help them to be more successful in every single aspect. Every business was yeah. elevated if their employees learned emotional intelligence. Every relationship is elevated. Every family is elevated. And I think, wow, it's elevated me. I have learned so much by learning emotional intelligence. And so I'm so grateful for all of the mentors who have taught me that. And I'm so grateful for any opportunity that I have to share any of those insights that I have learned. One of my mantras is that if I can help one person to not suffer as I have, then I feel like my suffering was not in vain. And yeah. that, that brings me so much joy. That's what uh. I do. I love that. I love that. That's a, that's beautiful, Karen. I, you know, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You, you are just a wonderful person. I I'm truly honored to, to meet you. And I, I'm so glad that we had the chance to speak today and you were just, you just unbelievable. You're a wonderful person, both inside and out. The, your beauty shines from within and it shows in your, in your smile and in your eyes. And you're just, you know, everything you said today was so meaningful. So it had so much purpose. And I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for sharing to my listeners. Thank you. Thank you so much for the the privilege to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me and and thank you for connecting with me. I I just I feel like we have so much in common and and I I, I feel I just feel so much love from your heart. And so I I appreciate you so much. So thank you for for blessing me with the opportunity to be with you today. Oh, thank you. And you have a great day. Thank you, you too. <laughs>